uh, today's uh, uh, seminar, energy seminar. This is uh, part of the MIT Energy Initiative Seminar Series. And uh, we have them here to educate ourselves um, about what other people from the outside, their visions about where this energy field is going. As you know, uh, we've had this energy initiative going now for a few years, and it gets more and more up to speed uh, as we get into it. And uh, the uh, seminar series is very helpful uh, for educating ourselves. As we think about this whole um, uh, scenario, uh, timing is always very important. Of course, the energy initiative is massive in scope, and timing is urgent. But a uh, phase transition took place, people say, uh, with the election that we had about a month ago. And many of our visions and dreams maybe might happen, or, or at least people are somewhat more optimistic. So uh, we can dream, and uh, I can't think of a better person to dream with than George Crabtree who will be telling us about the Sustainable Energy Challenge. A couple of words about George. I don't have to say too much about him. Uh, <laughs> don't do that to him. It's OK to do it to me. Uh, uh, I've known George for, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. And uh, I know him from science. He's condensed matter experimental experimentalist par excellence, and his field is magnetism and superconductivity. That's what I know him for. Uh, but um, over the years, and working in a national laboratory, he's uh, developed a, a keen interest in um, a topic that's uh, uh, confronting us in this century is a very central problem, energy. And I uh, had an opportunity to head up the uh, materials division at Argonne National Laboratory and that's a vision of responsibility and where you can have some impact on the U.S. energy scene by having some vision and organizing things. So uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have him here so he can uh, talk to us about uh, uh, that problem. Um, he's had uh, lots of experience, uh, not only at Argonne, but on the national scene. And recently, not that recently, five years ago, we were together uh, doing one of the uh, basic energy science studies on the hydrogen uh, economy. <laughs> that was the first of 10 studies that they did, and they've had some influence on our science policy and thinking about energy. Uh, today, uh, George will give us some big picture about uh, energy and uh, some of his own perspectives, and including maybe some e excerpts from what he's learned on working in basic energy science policy committees and all of that sort of thing, which he's done for the profession. So not only is he a great scientist, but he's also been a great citizen. And that's another reason that we're really happy to have him here today. And we'll be talking more about this at dinner. So George. <laughs> Just things a little bit. <laughs> Is it? Uh, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. I'll just stay away from that. So anyway, thanks, uh, Millie, for that wonderful introduction. Is it? Should I do something here? I think we don't really need this one. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. 
what a great introduction, Millie. Thanks for the invitation to come. And I, uh, uh, it's a real honor. And I feel a little strange talking about energy at, the home, at MIT, which is the home of so much energy research. OK, maybe the, is there a? So I should probably keep talking so you'll know when it's, uh, when it's down. Is that better? That's OK, good, great. So as Millie said, uh, energy is one of the most interesting topics around. And I remember a famous quote by Richard Feynman, who said, uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And you can say the same about energy. If you think you understand energy, you probably don't understand energy. It's very rich. It's very subtle. And this is one of the things that I learned in the last five years since working initially with Millie on the hydrogen uh, workshop, uh, how rich and subtle it is. And it's a problem, of course, that's not only scientific. It's also very uh, societal. It, it touches everyone of, any, every one of our uh, lives, every one of our lives. And, uh, and it, it, it's government, it's industry, it's individuals, it's sociology, it's politics, it's everything. So if you want to be interdisciplinary, this is the place to be. So I wanted to tell a little bit, one perspective. Uh, Millie said it might be a little bit uh, personal, and it is uh, just one piece of the personal perspective that I have. Uh, the problem is so big and so interesting that you can't pack it all into one hour, of course. And that's a few things about sustain sustainability. So clearly, when we are talking about energy, you want to have a sustainable component. I'll develop that a little bit in my first few slides. But there's a component that probably won't be sustainable. And that will be very important, certainly going forward in the short term, and even perhaps for the long term. And we shouldn't ignore that. So please don't take this to be a one-sided uh, presentation. I just want to say a few things about sustainability that maybe haven't been uh, said loudly enough, and certainly were surprising to me when I realized them. So uh, that's roughly what I'll talk about, some fossil energy challenges, some sustainable alternatives. And I want to highlight on two things. Electricity and hydrogen, which in fact are really quite sustainable, are almost sustainable. And uh, one of the points of what I want to say is what do we have to do to make them sustainable? And that is the last line up there, materials for energy. Uh, won't get to that until the end, but that turns out, I think, to be the key to, to, uh, to most energy problems and certainty, certainly to sustainability. So let's start with some big picture. Uh, where are we with energy? Here's a plot of all the energy that's been used in the world from 1970 till the present and projected 25 years to the future uh, in the unit of terawatts. Take all the uh, energy that we produce every year, humans produce, in joules divide by the number of seconds, uh, joule per second, so watt, and that's the, that's the y-axis. You need the prefix tera to make it a small number. Uh, and you can see um, that it's going up. So the top line is the, uh, is the total world use. The slope in the future is bigger than the slope in the past. We're sitting right now about where the, where the dotted line is, and that's maybe 13 or 14 terawatts. That's, what, that's the rate at which we use energy now on Earth. Uh, and uh, you can see how it's broken up, the few curves below that. So the industrial world used about half the total energy. U.S. uses about half the industrial, so that's about 25%. Oh, great. And uh, yeah, so here we are. Here's the U.S. We use about 25% of the energy. We have about 5% of the population. So there's a tremendous imbalance there. But that imbalance is changing. If you look at the developing world, that's here. Uh, growing quickly, in fact, the biggest slope on this graph is the developing world, and that slope pretty much is that slope. It drives the, major, the, the total slope. Uh, and it won't be too long until the developing countries use as much energy as the industrial countries. Where do we get it? Here's uh, a breakdown by fuel. So almost 40% is oil, about 20% is gas and coal, roughly speaking. 7 or 8% is nuclear and renewable. That's all there is. There isn't, that covers all the energies we have. 85% of that is fossil. So uh, if you project this, this thing, this top graph, top line uh, forward, in 2050, we'll need about twice the energy that we use now. That projection may be a little bit smaller based on the recession that we're now in, but it really won't change it very much. And by 2100, many people say three times the energy. We really don't know where that energy is going to come from. That's uh, a huge increase. 
And you might say, well, it's 85% fossil nowadays. Let's just uh, double the amount of fossil energy that we use. Why wouldn't that work? Here are some of the reasons why there are challenges with that. Uh, I have four of them. The first one is uh, sustainability. So it's very clear that this, 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 so what is this? This is a plot of the oil that we've used in billions of barrels per year versus time. Uh, and uh, it's clear that the rate at which we use all fossil fuels, including oil, is much higher than the rate at which they can be created in nature. And that means it's fundamentally unsustainable. It's not sustainable. It's a question of when. Uh, and uh, that question of when is really the question of urgency that uh, you may feel is uh, near term or, or long term. But here's an interesting plot. So this is the, num the amount of oil we used since 1900, almost none. Coal was king then. We started to build interstates and, and use oil for transportation. That's this big mid-century rise. Here are a couple of peaks. That was the oil crisis of the 1970s. In fact, this one. And this was uh, about 1980 when the price got very high, uh, up to 80 or $90 a barrel in today's dollars. And you see an interesting thing happened, which has all, has hap history has now just repeated itself in 2008. We use less oil. The price got high and we use less. And we started to talk about conservation and we started to talk about energy problems. Uh, and then the price of oil went down and we started to sort of resume our old ways and consumption went up. And here it is, about 2% a year demand growth at, at the present time. So that happened again in 2008. Uh, and I noticed that uh, I drive every day back and forth on the expressway to work, that uh, people who used to drive 80 were driving 65 last July. Uh, and uh, they were not changing lanes as often. And about a month ago, when the price got down to $2 a gallon, the old ways resumed. I think the reaction is almost immediate. So consumers react instantly to the price of oil. And that may be the major thing they react to. It isn't the intellectual uh, you know, uh, sort of meaning of the energy crisis. It's really how much does it cost. So if you go forward, uh, here's some projections going forward. Uh, and I, they're not to be taken too seriously, but they do suggest that uh, the amount of oil in the world is finite. In fact, the latest estimates, or at least uh, about two years ago, the Geological Survey estimated about 3,000 billion barrels of oil in the Earth. That's all the oil that's ever been there and all the oil that still remains. Uh, and that's a finite number. So if the integral under this curve has to be that number. And that means at some point, it's going to have to turn over and go down, because it has to be a finite number. And there's a, there you can make some assumptions based on this number about when that will happen. And here are two of them. One is they're all just assumptions on what happens after the peak. So let's look at this one first. If it's, this is very symmetric. So if we use 2% less oil every year after the peak, you just get this curve. And the peak then occurs in 2016. If you use 10% of what's left after the peak, you get this curve. And the peak occurs in 2037. So never mind if those are right, and certainly it won't be a peak like that. There'll be some very broad maximum and so on. But it does give an idea of when we might start to feel it. Uh, and after we feel it, uh, there are, it's not the end of the world. Things, uh, you know, there will be other oil, other sources of oil, unconventional oil, so oil sands and oil shale. And there's a lot of that around. Nobody knows exactly how much, but there's enough to, to use. Uh, it's more expensive to get. So it costs, according to, as I wrote here, the break-even point for using these resources about $30 or $40 a barrel. And you might have said last January, it's a no-brainer. Let's start uh, producing it. And now with the price of oil less than $50 a barrel, maybe it's not a no-brainer after all. So it's the companies that have decided to wait, as they always do, until they're sure that they're not going to lose money. Uh, and that turns out maybe to have been uh, a, a wise decision. It also produces more, it's heavy, that means there's more carbon in it, so it produces more CO2 per gallon of gasoline by about 50% than the conventional oil does. So these are some of the issues. Um, there's another issue, that's sort of sustainability. Do you have enough? Uh, the second issue is, so let's say you do have enough, can you get to it? So here's a plot of uh, reserves uh, production and consumption for U.S., OPEC, and the rest of the world. And you see, so reserves are in blue and consumption is in red. And you see immediately there's an inverse relationship. 
the places that, uh, that, uh, that have a lot of oil don't use it, and the places that use a lot of oil don't have it. And that's inherently unstable. So we are able to uh, sort of mitigate or modulate uh, the price of oil just by supply and demand until a few years ago. Uh, and uh, more recently, the pattern is that the price is driven by fear. What if, what if the supply were interrupted? Uh, and you can see that after this peak, when maybe there's less oil than we'd like to have by a uh, significant amount, then this, situa this unstable or potentially unstable geopolitical situation could start to get re really much more serious. So that's the second issue. The third one is pollution. So I've shown here traffic in Los Angeles and the output of cars is, of course, one of the major uh, sources of pollution, and especially in natural basins like Los Angeles, it tends to collect, and you can really see it here. But there's another one, uh, and I've shown here as acid rain, but uh, you see where acid rain was. This is in the last decade in the eastern United States. It has regions where it's quite heavy, and if you look more carefully, you see that these regions are downwind from coal-burning power plants. So this is the two sources, really, of pollu local pollution or regional pollution, cars and power plants. And those, that's something that, although it's gotten a lot better in the States uh, in the last 20 years, is still not solved. And other countries, especially China and developing countries, are facing this problem in spades. And here's the fourth problem. And many people say this is the most serious one. It's an interesting plot of um, time. So here's 400,000 years before the present and uh, two greenhouse gases, CO2 and CH4, and on this side, the relative temperature of the Earth. These are in th three different colors, so uh, black, uh, red, and blue. And without even looking at the graph, you see immediately that they track each other beautifully. There's a huge correlation, an almost perfect correlation, between greenhouse gases and temperature of the Earth on this time scale. Um, you can't tell from this data which came first. So did, it warm, did the earth warm up first and that produced the greenhouse gases or was it the other way around? You just can't tell that from this. Uh, and you see a couple of interesting things. You see that it's very asymmetric, that the earth warms up much faster than it cools down. And you see that there seem to be limits. So there's a natural upper limit here and a lower limit here and the atmosphere or the earth shuttles between these two limits with a pretty regular period for reasons that we don't really understand, but that's what it does. Uh, and it's interesting to think about where, where is human history on this graph. Well, this is the last glacial maximum that was about 20,000 years ago. Uh, modern humans appeared on the Earth somewhere, let's say, between 150 and 50,000 years ago, so somewhere in this last cold period. Uh, and we had 10,000 years of global warming. Uh, and for the last 10,000, a little bit hard to see on this graph, but for the last 10,000 years, the climate's been, the temperature's been pretty stable. And that's when all of civilization occurred. So that's when agriculture was invented, that's when cities started to grow, that's when we got civilization and organization uh, and uh, technology occurred, and all of those things that we associate with the modern world came within the last 10,000 years of climate stability. Um, if you look, you might say, well, here we are, we're up at the top. So according to this cycle, it's time to turn around and go back down. That's not what's happening. So here's a plot of the last 1,000 years. Uh, so CO2 and temperature of the Earth. And you see that, indeed, there was what looks like a little cooling. Uh, and then about 17, 1750 or so, warming, clear warming. And a, again, a very good correlation between CO2 and, uh, uh, and temperature. And if you look on, this goes up to the year 2000, and it's about 300 and, I guess, 40 or so. Uh, the number for, for 2004 is 380. If you plot it on this graph, it's right here. It's way outside the historical range. So we're doing an experiment with the Earth, and we don't know the outcome. It's impossible to predict. But you can imagine what some of the outcomes might be. So that's one of the issues, and uh, it's an even more serious issue when you think of the relaxation time. For, for CO2 to go to the deep ocean takes somewhere between 400 and 1,000 years. So that means that uh, all the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere until now, we're going to have to live with uh, until finally it equi equilibrates. So that's a challenge. So what have we looked at? We've looked at fossil. That's here. There are other alternatives. There's fission. 
a uh, great way to produce electricity. There's renewable, and that means solar, wind, hydroelectric, ocean tides, lots of other things all grouped together. Probably shouldn't be, but they are. There's fusion, which is a wonderful idea, and if it would ever work, it would be just, just superb, and we certainly should pursue that. And there's the biggest opportunity at the moment for saving energy, or actually creating new energy, is simply efficiency, how we use energy. Uh, and uh, uh, how our hab our so both our social habits and our technical uh, approach to, to using energy. So uh, it's a big problem. We said that you have to double by 2050. That means there's about 14 terawatts or some number like that that we need to get. How much is that? Well, 10 terawatts, that's 10,000 one gigawatt power plants. That's the size of a coal plant or a nuclear plant. That's one new power plant every day for 27 years. It's a huge problem. China is working on it. They're putting in about a gigawatt a week, and it's all coal. Uh, but you see the size of the challenge. Now, you, you wouldn't want to get all that energy as electricity. You'd want some of it for transportation and so on. So this is a little bit misleading, but it does tell you how big the problem is. And the takeaway message is down here. There's no single solution. You have to try all of these things. Uh, you're going to need more than one, and you don't know at this stage which one is really going to work out the best. So you need to invest in all of them. Uh, and everyone talks about sustainability. And I, you know, it's one of those words that, how could you not like it? Of course you want to be sustainable. But uh, there are conflicts. It's not such a simple concept. So there's energy sustainability. Uh, do you have enough so resources to supply the energy you want? There's environmental sustainability. And these two often conflict with each other. And there's economic sustainability. All three of these need to be balanced. And it isn't clear what's the best balance, and people don't even agree on that. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we have elections, like we had about a month ago. Uh, and Millie was referring to a new possible new era. Everyone is optimistic that now my vision of the world will become the one that's implemented. So we'll see if that really works. But that's why we have elections, to try to mediate between these three kinds of sustainability that, that uh, often are in conflict with one another. Uh, and remarkably, although we talk about sustainability all the time, we really don't know what it means. And I'm going to give you now three definitions of sustainability to let you think a little bit about which one is, let's say, the most appropriate. So here's the first one. What does it mean? Well, maybe it means lasts a long time. So if you had oil in 1900, it would look like it basically would last forever. We're hardly using any, and we've got plenty. And you might feel the same way about coal in 2008. We do have a lot of coal, hundreds of years. So is, is that what you mean by sustainability? Uh, here's the second definition. It's a little more restrictive. Does no harm. So nuclear electricity produces, doesn't produce any CO2. That's maybe, in a sense, better than coal, less harmful than coal. Ethanol is a way of uh, getting transportation fuels. It certainly has less CO2 than, than gasoline does. Uh, and from that point of view, it uh, might appear to be more sustainable. But here's the most restrictive definition, and this is quite a technical one. Uh, leaves no change. So you, you leave the world in exactly the same state as you started. Uh, that means you want to close the chemical cycle, so you don't have any excess chemicals at the, at the end of the energy use cycle uh, that you didn't have when you started with. And certainly, fossil fuels don't satisfy that criteria. But two things potentially do. And these are the two things that I wanted to talk about and highlight, really, in this talk, electricity and hydrogen. You can make them uh, uh, satisfy this very restrictive definition of sustainability. So let's start by thinking about electricity a little bit. Uh, here's the, the whole chain of electricity from production over here to use on this side. We typically make it by burning something or producing heat. And the combustion, the heat from that combustion, we then turn into a heat engine to put it into a heat engine, turn it into mechanical motion. We hang a generator on the end of the, of, uh, the thing that's turning to produce electricity. We then send it into the power grid, and then we use it for lots of things, which are shown over here on the right-hand side. Uh, it's really very, very versatile. And the fact that there's so many uses for electricity is the reason it's become so popular. Uh, it's, it's, um, where's the efficiency in here? Where's the sustainability? Well, if you, look, if you cut this off, the production side, and just look from this side, it's actually both pretty efficient 
and pretty sustainable. So generating electricity can be 90, 95% efficient. We lose about maybe 6 to 10% in the power grid just from joule heating. And many of these things, such as electric motors, which can be 95% efficient, really use the energy very, very well. And it doesn't, from this point on, it's just electrons. They go through a circuit, they do some work, and they come back. They don't leave anything. So it satisfies the condition of leaves no change. But the, uh, the production side is a problem. So on the production side, about 35% of our primary energy goes into producing electricity, and that's expected to grow, especially if things like plug-in hybrids and electric cars actually come to pass. We're going to need more electricity than we do now. We also get about a third of our CO2 emissions from, from uh, producing electricity. And the efficiency is pretty dismal. It's only 34% efficient. Part of that is due to Carnot efficiency. So the many boilers and, and generators don't work at very high temperature, and so they're limited. But nevertheless, 65% uh, of the energy never appears on the other side as, as useful energy. So if you could do something about this production side, you would actually have a rather sustainable energy carrier electricity. Uh, here's a picture of the grid. The National Academy of Engineering said that the, the electricity grid is the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And it's, it, it's really it's the biggest machine on Earth, for sure. Uh, and uh, it is really quite impressive. And I think the triumph was bringing electricity where you want it. That's what we did with the grid. It started locally around cities. You had you know, municipal grids. They knit together in some organic way to produce a national grid. And if you want, if you're in the United States and you want uh, power, you can call up and for a certain amount of money have arranged to have a wire brought in, a wire that you could hold in your hand and that you could get megawatts of power out of. And it's very, uh, it's very, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It's very directed. So if you have a certain use for energy and you bring it in as electricity, you bring it right to the place you want. You have a switch in the line that you turn it on and off when you want. Uh, and you don't, it doesn't spread to the neighboring you know, surrounding region like uh, burning a fossil fuel would. You usually heat up a big area. You can't confine it as well. So electricity is clean. It's switchable. Uh, it's, uh, it's versatile. And that's why we like it so much. But if you look here, you see where the industrial world has, has plenty of electricity. There are lots of dark areas. And these dark areas represent places in the world where there isn't much electricity or any. It's about 1.4 billion people that don't have electricity. And that's a big challenge for the coming century. And although the triumph of the last century was bringing in the, in the industrialized countries, bringing, bringing electricity wherever you wanted it, that's the challenge going forward. There's not enough capacity to, to give the uh, uh, developing world the electricity that it wants. That's a major challenge. So if you look at the 21st century instead of the 20th going forward, what are the challenges in the industrial countries? Well, the first one is capacity, even in the United States, because we use our electric power in cities and suburbs. That's where we like to live. That's, the, in fact, the growth of cities and suburbs is the dominant demographic trend of the last 5,000 years, and it's still going on. We like to live there, but you have to, it's very energy intense. So it's, there's a high energy density in cities. You have to get the electricity in, and you have to distribute it within the city. Both, uh, both parts are a challenge. If you look into 2030, the projection is a 50% demand growth in the US and 100% demand growth in the world. Uh, that's quite a challenge. So capacity, how do you get it in? And of course, uh, in cities, it's all mostly underground cables. Uh, those get saturated. And if you want to double the capacity or 50% more capacity, you have to dig up the infrastructure underground. So that's one problem. Second problem is reliability. Uh, here's an interesting chart of power lost on the average per, cu uh, per customer you know, in minutes per year. US 214, France 53, Japan 6. So you see that we're the champ, uh, and uh, we can do a lot better. There's, there's a, there are real problems. Part of that is the aging infrastructure, electrical infrastructure that we have. Economically, power outages are expensive, about 80 billion a year. And remarkably, it doesn't matter whether it's a momentary power, power outage or an extended one. 
the cost of each one is about the same. So about 33% of the interruptions are sustained. That costs about a third of the, this total. And uh, two-thirds are momentary, and that's about two-thirds of the total. And part of that is because we're so digital nowadays that even a momentary interruption can, can be as disastrous as an extended one. The third challenge is efficiency. Uh, you lose somewhere, estimates vary, 6 to 8% of the power that goes into the grid never comes out uh, because it's lost to joule heating. And that represents actually, because we use so much electricity, a lot of energy. That's the equivalent of about 41 gigawatt plants that you wouldn't have to have if you didn't lose this power in the grid. And of course, there's plenty of CO2 that that represents as well. So those are the three challenges. There is one very interesting, novel, almost revolutionary solution, and that is a superconducting grid, or at least parts of the grid. So in 1986, high temperature superconductors were discovered. They, could, they, they have transition temperatures above 100 Kelvin, which means you can use liquid nitrogen uh, as the coolant. Uh, they carry um, high current at low voltage, at zero voltage if it's DC, but if it's an AC circuit, there's a little unavoidable low voltage. So you can get five times the power in the same cross section. So if you have a superconducting cable, same cross section as copper, you can put five times the power through. So you imagine that in cities, if, which are congested, underground cables are congest, congested, uh, you just simply pull out the copper and put in the superconductor without digging anything up and you suddenly have a five times increase in the capacity, which is huge, enough to last for decades. Uh, and then reliability, that won't say too much about that, but superconductors are smart and self-healing because they, when the current gets too high, they suddenly go normal, and that limits the current, so you can make so-called fault current limiters out of superconductors that actually outperform uh, conventional ones by uh, a large margin, and the power companies really want this. And of course, efficiency, zero resistance at DC, uh, maybe 100 times lower than copper at AC. So you would save energy as well for those parts of the grid that are superconducting. Well, you, and that's it's actually being done now. Here's a, uh, a demonstration project in Columbus, Ohio. This is the superconducting cable that's going to go underground. In that black uh, tube is contained a cryostat, so liquid nitrogen flows around the outside to, co to cool it. And inside it are wires that look like this. Here, the superconductor is a little thin, only one micron thick uh, layer here, and there are maybe seven or eight other layers that are needed to give it strength and keep it oriented correctly and uh, prevent impurities from uh, migrating up and down and spoiling the superconductivity. So it's a rather complex um, uh, architecture for the wire, and it's a rather complex material itself. Yttrium barium copper oxide is the one that's used for these applications. And it has a complicated unit cell with four elements in it. You have to control it in certain ways. And in fact, with superconductors, you have to put defects into it on purpose in order to get the critical current up. It's, 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 it's a real materials challenge. But there are many demonstrations. The first one was in Copenhagen in 2001. Here's three more in the States. There are a couple of more in Europe. Uh, I guess I should have said that this is the transition between the uh, superconducting and the normal. The normal wasn't connected here. This was before. Taken, picture taken before that happened. But three phases, and they would go right in here. So uh, that can be done. Uh, the thing that, that, and that's a great solution for cities. There's another thing about the grid, though, that we need to worry about, and that is where to get all the energy, so the production side. Coal's about 52% of electricity, and as we said before, about a third of the emissions, and there's also some pollutants that come out. It would be great to replace that with something that's completely renewable, like wind or like solar. We'll never be able to do that 100%. And of course, we want to keep using the coal-fired power plants that we have. So you need, first of all, to catch the CO2 that comes out, put it underground, some kind of sequestration. And this is just a few cartoons and a few pictures of the materials that are involved. It's actually a rather serious uh, scientific challenge. You don't know what will happen when you put the CO2 underground. Uh, and here's some of the things that you have to do. You have to Take a low density, low viscosity, supercritical fluid, stick it into rock, pump it into rock at high pressure. Uh, you don't have any control of where it will go, how it will chemically react with the rocks down there, uh, and the ambient fluids like water. And it's very hard to monitor because it's so far away from the surface. 
So there are lots of science needs, and they're here. I won't read them, but there are lots of, lots of chemistry of CO2 with minerals that you need to understand. You don't want the CO2 to leak out. If it leaked out at 1% per year, then in a century it would have effectively all leaked out, and you would have done nothing because a century is just not a long enough time for sequestration to have any impact. So there are science issues and materials issues that have to do uh, with sequestra sequestration. If you want to go beyond that, though, and actually produce your energy renewably, take a look at this map. So this is the US version of the, of the grid at night. Where is the wind? Well, there's lots of wind up in the north central US. Where is the sun? There's lots of sun in the southwest. Where's the demand? It's on the east coast, most of it. And that just shows that you need to find a way to get this renewable energy from its source to its market. That's a long way. And in fact, the grid isn't built for that. It's built for local distributions, you know, hundreds of miles, but not thousands of miles. It's really not very good at that. Uh, and here's uh, superconductivity offers another chance there to have uh, long distance transmission that's lossless. It's really the losses in, conventional, in the conventional grid that limit the length that you can uh, transport the electricity. There's lots of reasons you might want to do that. We already saw in the last slide that to get renewable electricity to market is one. But if you could have a transcontinental grid and use the excess power that's produced, let's say, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in California early in the morning, ship it to, uh, when it's not needed, ship it to New York where it's, say, mid-morning and it is needed, or the other way around at night, so ship the excess power from New York back to California, you could level out this almost factor of two difference in the diurnal load of, uh, of most generating plants, and you, you, could save, you could save a lot of energy because it would just be a lot more efficient to run that way. But you may want to share power for other reasons. So you might want to cross weather boundaries. If it's hot in the south and cool in the north, you can share power north-south. Uh, and there's another idea which is very interesting. You could generate, so what do we do now? We, we mine coal in Wyoming send it to Ohio to produce electricity, wouldn't it be better to produce the electricity at the mouth of the mine in Wyoming and send the electrons to Ohio instead of sending the coal to Ohio? But you can't do that now because it's just not practical. So one solution, again, is superconductivity. Higher temperature, higher current, superconducting materials are what's needed if you want to have a long-distance grid. But now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about Storing energy, if you have renewable energy sources, they're intermittent and you have to store. Uh, and, this, and, 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 and if you have uh, uh, variations in load for, or demand for electricity, you'd like to store at the utility scale. How do we store energy? So here's an interesting graph. It shows the volumetric energy density, so energy per, per unit volume, versus gravimetric energy per unit weight for various fuels. And you see, let's start down here at the bottom. Uh, on this graph, pretty close to the origin, are batteries and supercapacitors. So that's the best lithium ion battery you can, you can find. Uh, and that just shows that it's very hard actually to store electrons uh, in batteries. If you have chemical storage, so what about the chemical fuels? Well, here's some hydrides. That's a little better. Here's the goal that DOE set for hydrogen storage to make electric transportation uh, fuel cell transportation practical. Here's ethanol and here's gasoline. And the scale here is just amazing. So between gasoline and batteries, depending on how you count, it's a factor of 30 or a factor of 50. It's almost impossible to think that batteries are going to get as good uh, as gasoline as an energy storage medium. And this graph also shows why we drive around in our cars with gasoline tanks on the back. That's the best way to store energy to let you drive 300 miles. It's really hard to beat it. But that's the challenge if you want to find alternatives to fossil. And, and one takeaway message from this graph is that batteries alone won't do it. You need to have chemical storage if you're going to really uh, cover your needs. So you need all of those, but you certainly need chemical storage. And the chemical carrier or storage that I would like to present and talk about a little bit now is hydrogen. So here's another energy chain, sort of like the one for electricity. You produce hydrogen somehow here on the left-hand side. You store it in, uh, in gas or as a, a hydride, some 
some uh, chemical storage. And then you use it, and you can use it in automotive fuel cells, so electric vehicles powered by, by, uh, by fuel cells. You can, consumer electronics, you could, uh, your laptop would maybe uh, run for six hours instead of two hours if you had a fuel cell driving it. And you can use it for stationary uh, electricity and heat generation for neighborhoods, let's say, small towns. So uh, this is the way in which you envision hydrogen being used. Um, is it, uh, most, of our, most of our production nowadays is from fossil fuel reforming. So you take natural gas, react it with, with water, and you produce hydrogen and CO2. So there are some problems with this, namely that you do produce CO2, and you need a lot of natural gas if you're going to, let's say, replace transportation fuels. Uh, you would re you run the risk of, of, re of replacing uh, an oil, foreign oil dependency with a foreign gas dependency. dependency. So that's where 90% of the H2 in the US, uh, the hydrogen in the US comes from. But you can also produce it other ways. You can split water, and that's really the best way to do it. You can do it with electricity from solar, wind, or hydro. You can do it thermochemically by high temperature cycles. Or you can do it the way biology does it, or a bio-inspired way, just at room temperature. Plants are doing this all the time, uh, using sunlight to split water and produce hydrogen. Um, What's sustainable about this? Well, it's sustainable, again, like electricity, beyond the production side. So storage and use is actually very sustainable. Here's the basic reaction, whether you do it electrochemically or by combustion. Hydrogen plus oxygen makes water. Doesn't leave anything harmful. Pretty much as if you've got, if you've got the hydrogen from water initially, then you, you leave no change. Uh, and, uh, and it's really very, very sustainable. So the issue is the production side. Here's another way of saying the same thing, the appeal of hydrogen closing the cycle. You imagine that water is a carrier of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a carrier of energy. And if you, if you have water and put energy in from some source here to split the water and produce hydrogen, when you, recover, when you use that hydrogen, oxidize it, you get energy out to produce the water again down here, and you've closed this cycle. The question is, where do you get the energy in and where do you get the energy out? And of course, you never make it equal. You always lose something in the process. So how efficient can you really make it? Well, you want to get the energy in from, let's say, solar or wind electricity. That could be electrolyzers. So big electrolyzers are about 80% efficient. So that's kind of interesting. That's one way to do it. But why, have, why make the electricity? You could just have uh, sunlight, the energy of the photon, photocatalytically split water directly and produce the hydrogen without the electricity step. Uh, and that those would be the renewable ways, let's say, the sustainable ways of, of using hydrogen. And how would you take the energy out? You'd like to do it in fuel cells, because fuel cells convert hydrogen energy, this, this wonderful sustainable carrier, into electricity, which is a second sustainable carrier. So these two, hydrogen and electricity, really make sense uh, to work together. And here's a, here's a little picture of the fuel cell. So what is it? It takes hydrogen from the um, inside here, yeah, from the left, uh, splits the hydrogen. So it's, it's uh, into atomic hydrogen on, on the anode. There's a catalyst here that, that uh, strips off an electron. The electron is sent through an external circuit and does electrical work. That's how you turn it into electricity. The proton that's left goes through a membrane over to the cathode where it's reunited with the electron that went through the circuit. And, uh, also, uh, oxygen molecules are brought in here. And so the protons, the electrons, and the oxy oxygen mole molecules react on the cathode to produce water. So basically, you're doing the same thing as if you had burned the hydrogen by combustion. It's the same reaction, but you're doing it electrochemically, and you're doing it much more efficiently. So fuel cells can have an efficiency, let's say, of 60%. That's uh, within range of the catalysts we know now. Uh, much better than a gasoline engine, which typically is 25% or 28%. Uh, depends how you count. So you'd like to do this. So in a way, electrochemistry is the new combustion. Instead of burning your fuels, you'd rather convert them electrochemically and get, get the energy out as electricity. And it's a, so, so this uh, is a natural partner here between hydrogen and electricity. Hydrogen is stable. You can store it as long as you want. It's chemically stable. It's a... Uh, as an energy carrier. Electricity, you have to produce 
on demand. So you have to produce as much electricity in the grid as you take out, and you have to balance that dynamically. So you, it's very hard to store it on the scale that you need. So these two are very natural that way. Uh, and, and down here, electric transportation, hydrogen plus the fuel cell, it's a way of electrifying cars. Uh, batteries are another way, and you may want to use both, uh, both approaches to see which one is better, or maybe eventually have both. And renewable electricity, you need to store the intermittent production of electricity from solar or wind. Somehow, hydrogen would be an excellent way to do that because you could recover it again as electricity when you need it. So that's, those are the two carriers. Uh, if we're talking about sustainability, there's really only one sustainable source that we ought to be thinking about, or at least one dominant one, and that's the sun. That's where we get basically all of our energy, including our fossil fuels, although it takes a long time for that to happen. Uh, but how much energy is there? You might worry that, that humans are going to eventually run into a limit of basically running out of energy. Well, it won't happen. Why not? Because the sun delivers about 1.2 times 10 to the fifth terawatts, here it is, to the surface of the Earth. And remember that we use about 14 terawatts right now. That's what humans use. So there's plenty of solar energy hitting the Earth. About 36,000 terawatts are on land, about 2,000 terawatts are on US land. So there's plenty of energy. How big is that? Let's compare it to some reference points. So the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, that was magnitude 7.8. That released about 10 to the 17th joules of energy. And that's what the sun delivers to the Earth in one second. Uh, how about another comparison? Well, Earth's ultimate recoverable resource of oil, so 3,000 billion barrels, uh, that's, that's uh, about 1.7 times 10 to the 22 joules. And that's what the sun delivers to the Earth in one and a half days. So it's really, the, the sun is really the 800 pound gorilla of energy sources. It's much bigger than anything else you can think of. Here's the, the last comparison, the annu annual human production of energy. Said it was about 13 terawatts. That's about 4.6 times 10 to the 20 joules. That's about an hour of sunlight. So the sun is really the, 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 the energy uh, source with the highest capacity and the one that we ought to be looking at. I won't go through this whole graph, but uh, it's very interesting. There are three ways that we use solar energy. We convert it to electricity. We convert it to fuel naturally through photosynthesis, or you could do it artificially in the laboratory, or you use the sun's heat, so solar thermal. Uh, all three are at various stages of development, both scientific and, uh, and, and uh, let's say, engineering or technological. But the interesting thing is at the bottom of this view graph, we hardly get any of our energy directly from the sun. So uh, we, we now get about, uh, here's in the world, two ten thousandths of a terawatt from PV, but we use one and a half terawatts. So it's really almost nothing. Uh, we do get quite a bit of energy from biomass, about one and a half, one and a half uh, terawatts. That's mostly done unsustainably, which means you cut the trees down, burn them, and don't replace them only about two-tenths of a terawatt is done sustainably. Uh, but we, and we need about 11 terawatts of energy. That's what we get from fossil fuels. So we get about 10% of what we use can come from, from uh, biomass from the sun. Solar thermal, it's about six thousandths of a terawatt, and you need about two terawatts. So there's a tremendous potential there that's still untapped. And that's one of the research challenges, is to figure out how to tap that. Uh, there's a lot more interesting. Uh, solar energy facts and, uh, and visions, and they're contained in this uh, basic research needs for solar energy utilization report that BES did and uh, uh, Millie referred to at the beginning. It's on the web. Uh, that's the 150-page version. Here's the sort of Reader's Digest version that Nate Lewis and I wrote uh, for Physics Today. It has pretty much all the same messages, and you can read it before you go to sleep at night. Uh, and in fact, here's the same diagram that we had on our last slide. So if you're interested, I would recommend these two things to look at. And now I'd like to step back a minute and ask the question, um, what is it that's going to get us, technically, what is it that's going to get us to a more sustainable energy future? And the answer I would like to give is complex materials. So if you think about fossil fuels and the, the economy we're in now, energy economy that we're in, the important materials are the fuels themselves. So it's, uh, it's coal, it's uh, oil, 
and its natural gas. That's, and we want those. Those are commodities. We want them so that we can burn them. Uh, and their value is in their cheapness, number one, and in their energy content. You want a high energy content and a low price. And that's what makes the world go around. In a sustainable world, it's different. The materials that count are not commodities that are used up in the energy production process. They're materials like uh, photovoltaics that convert an existing energy flow from the sun into electricity. These are much more complicated than uh, fossil fuels. So they need to be uh, efficient. They usually are composites. So one, one part captures the photon, another separate as an electron hole pair. Another part of the material separates that, and a third part collects the two charges, electrons and holes, so that they can be used. So they're rather complex, and, uh, and they have to be designed using principles that are revealed by basic science. So you can't, the, the way we view materials uh, in, an, in a more sustainable world is very different than the way we view them in a fossil uh, fuel world. So here's some examples. Dye-sensitized solar cells, well, what do you have? Inexpensive TiO2 nanocrystals, they're coated with, a, coated with a chemical dye, immersed in a liquid electrolyte. You need a transparent electrode on this side, at least one side, to let the sunlight in. And it's a complicated process by which you use these, or these cheap organic materials to produce electricity from the sun. Artificial photosynthesis, very complicated. You want to imitate nature. Uh, we, know, we know how to do that to a certain extent, but we're far from being effective at it. Here's the high temperature superconductors. These are complex materials on the atomic scale and also quite complex on the engineering scale to put the materials together. Here's the fuel cell, and here's catalysis, which underlies very, very many uh, energy conversion processes, also a very complex material. So the, the takeaway message is at the bottom here. Basic research is needed to make these complex materials, and that's what will enable the, the sustainable energy economy. So with that thought, I think I'll, I'll stop, and thanks very much. That's right. And you know, it's very interesting. Millie and I were on this uh, uh, workshop that looked at that. And as Millie pointed out, 2003, there weren't many, if you looked at how much hydrogen research was going on, for example, at the American Physical Society meeting, there wasn't much. After the workshop, and of course, funding fell, uh, went into the field, there was a lot more. And if you look in the last five years since 2003, there are enormous numbers, most of the progress I'll probably offend some people if I say that, but much of the progress was, uh, has come in the last five years. So there are new ways to, to solve that problem. Uh, you can look for new materials, and the phase space of materials is quite large, so we've by far not looked at all the possible ones. Things like alanates were popular uh, and promising in 2003. There are now even uh, things like uh, uh, boranes and uh, NH3, BH3, things like that have a lot of hydrogen in them look promising. And destabilized materials are interesting. So you take two hydrogen materials that actually have a high capacity for hydrogen, but high temperature is required to get it in and out. Let them react. They form a third derivative hydrogen storing material with uh, hydrogen, a third derivative hydride with less hydrogen in it, and they release more hydrogen than either one of them could at a lower temperature than either one of them. So the number of combinations of, of two hydrogen materials working together is huge. So there is, I think, promise there. And it's really a basic science problem. It's not so much, we don't have the material yet, so we're not ready to develop it. It's a question of finding it. So can you comment on the, the preponderance of rare and unusual materials that show up in some of these applications? If one were to really uh, get into uh, large-scale high temperature conductivity, one would presumably be immediately limited by lanthanum and vitrium abundance. And uh, if you were thinking about fancy uh, solar technology, like cadmium telluride, aren't these all 
also a very serious sustainability problem. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and, and if you had looked last spring at uh, the prices of commodities like that, precious metals and platinum and things that are uh, specialty materials that are required, they were going up enormously fast. And there were articles written about that's going to be a glass ceiling that we run into, that we won't, won't have enough materials for the kinds of things that I was showing at the end there to do. Uh, nowadays, the prices are not a problem. Uh, that's probably temporary because of the recession. Uh, but uh, it is an issue. And one needs to look at things that are really abundant. And when we look at catalysts, for example, platinum is everybody's favorite. There's not enough platinum in the world to run fuel cell cars. There just isn't. So we need to find something else. But there is, and this is often the case that if you look to nature, you find the counterexample or the proof of concept. Uh, nature doesn't use platinum. Green plants don't use platinum. They use manganese, for example, to split water. And there's plenty of manganese. And maybe that's the reason that nature hit on that solution. Uh, to uh, hydrogenase uses iron. There's plenty of iron around, most abundant thing in the Earth's crust. So there are alternatives to these specialty things. I think it's just that we don't understand how they work. And if we could understand how they work, we could make it work with the things that are abundant. But you're right, quite right. That's a challenge. That's, you know, uh, it's a couple of comments. It, so what do, what, is, what do we use for energy? So in the US, we use about 12 kilowatts per person. It's the average. In Europe, it's about six. Uh, and Switzerland, a few years ago, had a program where they wanted to make it two. Uh, and you know, that, so that's a noble cause, and one that certainly would have a big effect. I mean, an example that none of, uh, I can't speak for you, but I certainly don't do and could do is carpool to work. That would be a factor of two for that trip if I just had one passenger. And I don't do it because it's not convenient. Uh, so it's kind of hard to make that stick. But certainly, there's plenty of opportunities for, for using just using less energy. Um, I think the response to the oil high prices in the 1980s and in, in 2008 is an example. The number of miles driven, it's an interesting plot, number of miles driven since 1970 has been going up. And in 2008, it actually turns over. This is just published about a month ago. It's, so it's, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's monitored data. But the response is often to price. So maybe the way to make that happen is to make energy expensive. And in that sense, uh, oil at $50 a barrel is not a good thing. You know, we, would, we, would, we would develop better habits if it was 140 So good point, hard to make st stick. I keep thinking of Jimmy Carter with a sweater on, and it somehow it didn't work. You know? I mean, it isn't that it's wrong. It's just that that's not the way we, uh, we seem to operate. During transition, we could start to use some of the petrochemical infrastructure. Another advantage of, the hy of these uh, hydrocarbon hydrides, these are cyclic hydrocarbons or heterocyclic hydrocarbons, the kind that nature uses. You can plug molecules on and off these rings, and hydrogen pops on and off these rings. And the other advantage is that um, lost my train of thought. But my question to you is, what's the Department of Energy program on organic hydrides? Well, they're looking at so things like CHO, so as the, as the generic formula in various uh, proportions. Uh, and in fact, there are, uh, I think if you look at industrial uses of hydrogen, there are, uh, industry tends to store it by changing a carbon double bond to a single bond. And when you do that, you can release or absorb an, a hydrogen. The problem with it from a transportation point of view is that it takes, it, it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not space efficient. 
But if, it's, if you don't want to put it on your car, there's no reason not to do it. And in fact, uh, there's lots of industries that already do it. So it's a, it's a way of storing energy. And as you say, it's sort of a hybrid between uh, hydrogen and, and hydrocarbons. So you could maybe find a way to use either output, depending on what you needed. Um, it's an excellent idea. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what the Department of Energy is doing on it, but. but. An advantage of organic hydrides is that their conversion or regeneration or recycling can be done decentrally. It doesn't need to go back to coal mine mills for any generation, and the efficiencies are about 15% loss when you pull the hydrogen out. I think there's work at Argonne, isn't there? Really? There is some work at Argonne, that's right. Yeah. No. So it's a good way forward. But like many things with hydrogen storage, you have to do some more basic research to figure out how well could it possibly work or what's really happening. I mean, the problem, like with high temperature superconductors, you stumble on them and you find them. And you're very happy when you find one that's uh, like in 1986 that's a factor of 10 higher in transition temperature. Nobody's found anything like that since. So uh, you're kind of, it's phase space with materials that you have to worry about. So they're probably out there. Uh, things that are the hydrogen storage uh, and even the uh, organic ones, they're out there. It's just a question of finding them. We need to have a better way of directing our search so that we're closer to our target instead of being just random. Yes, back there. Uh, Dr. Crabtree, uh, when we started to hit uh, oil at about $150 a barrel, and I think uh, the average consumption per person in the United States is roughly 20 barrels, which would mean roughly uh, $3,000 per person or $12,000 a year for a family. Are, will we be reaching, especially when you mentioned, well, we, we, we might want to make uh, oil more expensive. Are we reaching a stage where if we want to find oil, the easiest way to do it is to mine the houses, uh, literally destroy them and put back something far more efficient. And instead of getting into this goofy, uh, carbon sequestration uh, uh, exchange system they want to get, which sounds, which is ridiculous, because it's going to be run by the same idiots that got us in the in the mess we're in now in Wall Street. We just auction. We just uh, the government takes an interest in the air rights over the houses, and we get a uh, consolidation. We get more efficiency because uh, we're not driving as far. I mean, who's who's looking at a at a system instead of a instead of one particular technology? I yeah. Think that, that's what we might want to do. It's great to look at systems, and we all ought to do that. The interesting thing about energy is that it's an emergent phenomena. And if you say, I'm going to control the system, if we have our car, we change the system to make it run the way we want. You really can't do that with the energy economy. It has to, people, a thousand people or a million agents make decisions every day. What am I going to do? And they'll usually, they're usually driven by money. So I'll do the cheapest thing. If the cheapest thing happens to pollute and produce CO2, well, I'll worry about that later. And I think that's the kind of the tragedy of the commons, is one way of saying it, that uh, point that you're getting to, is that we can't really control the energy, uh, the energy economy the way we might like to. And it's probably not a good idea to do it anyway. What we really want to do is figure out way, pressure points and key, key uh, actions that will induce the economy to do what's good for itself. And that's by price. So you make things more expensive or less expensive.
research in a particular area that might make this process more efficient? I mean, sure. So if you look at silicon solar cells with single crystal silicon, which is the dominant, that's 80% of the market now, they were 6% efficient in 1954 when they were first uh, was in the laboratory at that stage. Now they're 20% efficient. Uh, and that's, that comes from understanding the photovoltaic process, the, the scientific phenomena, and from improvements in silicon as a material, which also happens to have uh, an effect on electronics. So there's a double reason to do it. Uh, but uh, that comes from materials. So now there are other ways to make solar energy. So you can look at uh, very inexpensive organic materials. We have a donor and acceptor, that which can, both can be, you can choose from a whole host of materials. The problem is really there's too many to choose from. You don't know which one is best. And you have to make them relatively defect free because the defects trap the electrons or holes after they're separated and you lose them. Uh, so uh, they're about 5% efficient now, but if you look at their cost, they're much less than single crystal silicon. So the potential is there to have actually a lower efficiency, but in the end, a lower cost. So, and there are other things like disensitized solar cells uh, that I was showing there that are completely new ideas that, again, use cheap materials. If you could get the efficiency from 11%, where it is now, to 15%, you'd probably have a big impact still not reaching the 20% of, of uh, silicon. So that's why I say it's really, it's really materials, and there are lots of opportunities. One comment I had was uh, um, I've noticed in this past six months a tremendous experiment going on in the price of oil. And it seems to me that, that the price of oil has kind of got an inelastic component right about where you get production. And wouldn't it be smart uh, for the world, for the consuming countries, to keep their consumption of oil just below wow. the uh, ability of the producers to produce? And then we could get our oil for $50 a barrel and then charge our consumers the $150 a barrel so we could keep reducing their demand. Take the difference, which actually a figure off in the United States works out to be about $600 billion a year, care. but do a lot to reduce our deficit. That's yeah, a, there's that another number. Great funder of research. Yeah, that's a great idea. Sort of a no-brainer, isn't it? Well, but you have to realize that the supply is going to continue to shrink, right? Even though we're doing this, right? We're going to be following the downside of that curve, so we have to keep pushing demand yeah. back by increasing the price or whatever it takes to get people to convert away from oil. Oh, we're back there, Dan. I just want to remind everybody in the 14 terawatt number, that energy gap number, um, you have to make everybody remember that you always worry about the legacy world, which is the 3 billion people, but that number, 14 terawatt need, has the assumption in it that you will be saving 100% of the energy you use today. And it's because there's six billion missing people who are coming on board that's driving the 14 terawatt. So everything that everybody's saying about conservation and new, that's great. And that just is in your basic assumption of, of that we're going to do that and you're still going to need 14 terawatts. That's always forgotten in these discussions. Yeah, that's a really good point. And just to put another, uh emphasize it another way, if the whole 9 billion people that in, are going to be here in 2050 consumed at the rate that the U.S. consumed per capita, you'd need 100 billion, I, I mean, say 100 terawatts of, uh, of energy in 2050, and it's, it's only 26. That's because they're not going to consume at that rate. It could be much bigger. In this. Dan's point is well taken. The point is, is you better have all this new discovery of materials and engineering to save all the energy you use today, and you're still going to need a whole bunch of new discovery for the 14 you're talking about. Good point. Any more questions? Can't see. Whoever has their hand up, because I can't see you from here, please speak up. Okay, that person didn't materialize. Right. Yeah. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm getting back to my, my, my comment about mining the houses. If Switzerland, if we can go from 12 
Kilo wants to, to, to say the two that Switzerland wants to go. I mean, is Switzerland some kind of ferocious uh, dictatorship where, you know, if you just, if you don't save every last up, they just put you up against the wall and shoot you. I mean, uh, this tragedy of the common thing, that's, uh, that's starting to look like an excuse, not, a, not, a, not, a, not a, or an explanation. I mean, it's an excuse not to do something. And we don't, we, we just had, a, we just had a $10 trillion party and we have nothing to show for it. And then the idea that you know our free will created that situation, that's going to have to change, and it will. We just can't go on like this. It's stupid. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Discovery scientific knowledge, pass that on to the engine, uh, to the engineering community, to develop, develop it, that into applications. Where do you see the balance of that today? Of uh, how much, how much knowledge is waiting to be implemented versus how much knowledge needs to be gained? Hey, what a great uh, question. So, if you take all of the technologies that we now have and say I'm going to improve them incrementally, you won't be able to solve the problem. You, you need too much energy, and the CO2 problem is too big. So you need something new. And the only place new things come from, basically, innovation is another word for it. That can come anywhere, of course, engineering side or science side. But the science side gives you the materials and, understand, and the understanding of the phenomena to develop a new technology. So I believe that that investment is absolutely essential. Not to uh, take anything away from the engineering side. We need to do everything we can do everywhere uh, in order to solve the problem, the things we know how to do now and we can do better, but also the things that we don't know how to do. And photovoltaics are a good example, but you can look anywhere. Hydrogen economy has plenty of problems that need to be solved. They'll be solved by science. And although we can't see the solution now, in 20 years, we will see them. So what's the right number? I don't know. But you certainly don't. I mean, if you think about today's situation with a $700 billion credit crunch, uh, nobody can borrow money. It's relatively cheap to invest money in science. Because that's, that's kind of the small end of the problem. And if you do that for, say, five years and delay the uh, uh, deploying new technologies for five years, in the end of five years, you'll have something better to, to deploy. So it might make sense in this climate to emphasize the science side. Uh, I'd like to thank 